that's such a challenging thought experiment of like thinking about memories from the caterpillar to the butterfly as an organism. I think at the very basic level, intuitively, we think of organisms as hardware. Yeah. And uh, software is not possibly being able to be organisms. But right. what you're saying is that it's all just patterns in an excitable medium and we, it doesn't really matter what the pattern is we need to, and, and, what, and what the excitable medium is. We need to do the testing of what, how persistent is it, how goal-oriented is it, and there's certain kind of tests to do that. And you can apply that to memories, you can apply that to ideas, you can apply that to anything, really. I mean, you could probably think about like consciousness. You could, there's really no um, boundary to what you can imagine. Probably really, really wild things could be, could be minds. Yeah, stay tuned. I mean, this is exactly what we're doing. We're getting progressively like more and more unconventional. I mean, so so this so this whole distinction between software and hardware, I think I think it's a super important uh, concept to think about. And and yet the way we've mapped it onto the world, I I would I, I would like to blow that up in in the in the following way. Um, and, and again, I want to point out, so, so I'll tell you what the, what the practical, um, consequences are, because this is not just, you know, a f fun stories that we tell each other. These have really important research, um, implications. Think about a Turing machine. So one thing you can say is the machine's the agent, it has passive data and it operates on the data and that's it. The story of agency is the story of whatever that machine can and can't do. The data is passive and it moves it around. You can tell the opposite story. You can say, look, the patterns on the data are the agent. The machine is a stigmergic scratch pad in the world of the data doing what data does. The machine is just the consequences, the scratch pad of it working itself out. And both of those stories make sense depending on what you're trying to do. Here's the, um, the biomedical side of things. So our, bio, our, our program in bioelectrics and aging, okay? One model you could have is the physical organism is the agent and the, the cellular collective has pattern memories, specifically what I was saying before, goals, anatomical goals. If you want to persist for 100 plus years, your cells better remember what your correct shape is and where the new cells go, right? So there are these pattern memories that exist during embryogenesis, during regeneration, during resistance to aging. We can see them. We can visualize them. One thing you can imagine is, fine, the physical body, the cells are the agent, the electrical pattern memories are just uh, data, and what might happen during aging is that uh, the, the data might get uh, degraded, they might get fuzzy. And so what we need to do is reinforce the data, reinforce the memories, reinforce the pattern memories. That's one, that's one specific research program, and we're doing that. But that's not the only research program, because the other thing you might imagine is that, what if the patterns are the agent, in exactly the same sense as we think in our brains, it's the uh, patterns of uh, electrophysiological, um, you know, computations and whatever else that is the agent, right? Mm -hmm. And that what they're doing in the brain are the side effects of the patterns working themselves out. And those side effects might be to fire off some muscles and some glands and some other things. From that perspective, maybe what's actually happening is maybe the agent's finding it harder and harder to be embodied in the physical world. Why? Because the cells might get less um, responsive. In other words, the cells are sluggish. The patterns are fine. They're having a harder time making the cells do what they need to do. And that maybe what you need to do is not reinforce the memories. Maybe what you need to do is make the cells more responsive to them. And that is a different research agenda, so, which, which we are also doing. And we have evidence for that as well, actually, now. And then we've, we published it recently. And so my point here is when we tell these crazy sci-fi stories, the only worth to them and the only reason I'm talking about them now, and I hadn't been up you know, a year ago, I wasn't talking about this stuff, is because these are now actionable in terms of specific experimental research agendas that are heading to the clinic, I hope, in, uh, in some of these biomedical approaches. And so now here we can go beyond this and we can say, okay, so up until now, we've considered what, what are disease states? Well, we know there's organic disease. Something is physically broken. We can see the tissue is breaking down. There's this damage in the joint, you know, what, what the, the liver is doing, whatever, you know, we can see these things. But what about disease states that are not physical states? They're physiological states or informational states or cognitive problems. So in other words, in all of these other spaces, in the, you can start to ask, what's a barrier in gene expression space? 
what's a local minimum uh, that traps you in physiological state space? And what is a stress pattern that keeps itself together, moves around the body, causes damage, tries to keep itself going, right? What, what level of agency does it have? This suggests an entirely different uh, set of approaches to, to biomedicine. And, you know, anybody who, who's, let's say, in the uh, alternative medicine community is, is probably yelling at the screen and saying, we, we've been saying this for hundreds of years. And yeah, but, but and, and I'm, I'm well aware, these are not, the ideas are not new. What's new is being able to now take this and make them actionable and say, yeah, but we can image this now. I can now actually see the bioelectric uh, patterns and why they go here and not there. And we have the tools that now hopefully will get us to, to, to therapeutics. So this is, this is very actionable stuff. And it all leans on not assuming we know minds when we see them, because we don't, and we have to do experiments. To return back to the software hardware distinction, you're saying that we can see the software as the organism and the hardware is just the uh, scratch pad, or you can see the hardware as the organism and the software is the thing that the hardware generates. And in so doing, we can decrease the amount of importance we assign to something like the human brain, or it could be the activations, it could be the electrical signals that are the organisms. And then the brain is the scratch pad. And by saying scratch pad, I don't mean it's not important. When we get to talking about the platonic space, we we have to talk about how important the interface actually is. It's it's the scratch pad isn't unimportant. The scratch pad is critical. It's just that my only point is that when we have these uh, formalisms of software, of hardware, of other things, the way we map those formalisms onto the world is not obvious. It's not given to us. We, we get used to certain things, right? But, but who's the hardware, who's the software, who's the agent, and who's the, who's the excitable medium is, is to be determined. 